I always feel so not smart when I talk to a British person because you just sound so royal. At least you're not asking me if I know Harry Potter like I normally get. Wanna make that paper? Wanna make that now? This is the affiliate marketing show. Wanna make that paper? Wanna make that now? This is the affiliate What's up, everybody? This is Josh with the Affiliate Marketing Show. Please be sure to like, follow, and subscribe to stay up to date on all the latest affiliate marketing tips tricks and trends. I'm Josh from OfferVault.com, the industry's largest aggregator of all things affiliate marketing. We also have Mr. Paper Call, Adam Young, as well as the industry legend, Harrison Gewurz, plus our special guest today, Ian Leefield, the head of business development and affiliate management at Total Security, a company that's empowering people to safely navigate the digital world. What is up, Ian? Thanks for joining the show today. Thanks very much for having me, guys. Appreciate you coming on, man. And I'm actually really interested to dive right into some of our topics here. You know, I want to ask you about Total Security. Maybe you could give us a little bit of a, a bird's eye view. I was on your site, and I know you guys have a ton of different products that fall under that umbrella, including AV, antivirus, ad block, VPN, password cleaner, and more. So can you just tell us a little bit about Total Security, some of those products maybe touch on like which of those products you see are more popular than others. And then we can kind of go from there. Sure. So uh, total security in its current format has been around for about eight years. Um, we primarily focus on antivirus at the start. And since then we've added numerous other products within the space. So we've added ad blocker, VPN, password manager, and really, we tend to keep it under the total moniker. So our flagship brands are Total AV, Total VPN, Total Password. You know, we're real original with the names. Um, and I mean, antivirus has obviously been in the affiliate marketing space for many years. And as the years have gone on, we've noticed more and more that the other products are starting to appear. Um, ad blocker obviously is having a huge effect on things like YouTube at the moment. But these are incredibly popular with uh, people in the world at the moment. And really, Total AV has been a flagship brand for everything that we do. Um, all traffic types um, and overall security is just increasing more and more around the world. And VPNs, especially with what's going on with conflicts around the world and so forth, we're seeing a, a vast increase in take on VPN as well. So it's it's really just improving and growing all the time. So Ian, so, like, bro, what the fuck? Why are you blocking all these ads? <laughs> yeah, it's a bit of a weird one. Um, <laughs> you know, as you can imagine from, from well affiliate... done, well done. That was good. Yeah, I thought someone might <laughs> might bring that up. Um, yeah, from an affiliate standpoint, and certainly a media buying standpoint, that can create a few problems. Um, you know, a lot of the sources that we work with, probably the last thing they want to promote is an ad blocker, um, and we tend to try and stick our blocker with sources that um, allow it. Um, it means that we don't have to really do anything different um, because, you know, protecting our customers are our number one priority. Um, obviously, like most companies, we want the growth. We want to build. We want to keep trucking on. Um, but, you know, rules are rules, and we like to try and stick to them as best we can. Ian, to your knowledge, can you kind of – like maybe just give us an overview real of quick when... josh real quick. yeah good to, good to have you on by the way do you personally use an ad blocker me personally yeah i do and i don't i do on my turn that shit off dude the internet needs to eat bro come on how are you gonna run affiliate marketing for something and then block ads like wow that's fucking terrible wow um i tend to on my desktop um but not i you know not on my mobile um a big chunk of our traffic on people, behalf of affiliate marketing i'm offended uh yeah, yeah well, i think you need to delete that ad he's a, off your computer and he's a company man the advertisements no he's a company he man represents affiliates josh he's the affiliate guy over there so he's got to rep his people these are our people I get yeah, it. not, it's I people get it. like you that put affiliates on food stamps. <laughs> I 
mean, I think I think you're doing okay, Harrison. So, uh, you know. Ian, I was gonna I, I was gonna ask you, Ian, and maybe Adam and Harrison can chime in on this as well. When did uh, when did like anti virus and ad blockers really kind of gain a lot of momentum within the internet marketing world? Do you remember like roughly what? year ish it was and and how has it kind of evolved from then where is it today where do you think it's going but let's start at the beginning ian i'll go i'll go to you first sure so i think um antivirus specifically has been around for many many years you know the big players in the industry have been around 20 plus years online and offline um one of the big things that we do very well here is we like to go in and try and disrupt an industry and we knew that antivirus was incredibly tough to do because from a branding perspective um those other brands you know they've been around so long that people are named after them and the fact that their surname happens to be the name of the companies those kind of things so what i've noticed is, is that since we got into it we noticed that what the other brands were doing was quite a stagnant area um, a lot of them tend to run most of their traffic through networks, whereas we realized that actually if we could work direct with the affiliates, we could be more flexible, offer more. And I think that kind of took a hold about six, seven years ago, um, be it review sites, traffic sources, being able to offer a one-to-one -one kind of relationship, a direct relationship rather than through a network. Um, gave us a bit of an advantage. And I think it's kind of woken the industry up a little bit. Um, I'm sure you guys, especially Harrison, probably remembers the days of the, the installer traffic and downloads and installs and so forth. Um, there were some players in that industry back then, but um, maybe not so much now. Um, I know it still happens. We're not involved in that anymore. But, um, you know, there was a period of time for four or five years where, you um, any kind of software, let alone antivirus, cleaners, VPN, were prevalent. Um, and I think most of the traffic that we do and also that they do now um, is certainly more, you know, your displays, your push, your pop, that kind of traffic at the moment. Adam, do you have any experience, obviously not using ad blockers, but maybe on the flip side, trying to navigate around them or maybe like working in this industry where they've become more prevalent? No, I don't think there's a lot of affiliate marketers can do to actually navigate around an ad blocker because the ad blocker is running on the individual consumer's computer. And so it has the ability to check for ads on a few different layers. So if it's installed on a Windows device, for instance, it can go all the way down to the network card and parse the HTML of a website and pull out the JavaScript ad units before it even reaches the browser, which... A lot of these products do, um, and they also do on uh, like the the antivirus and and malware blocking front, um, also on the VPN level, right? So a lot of this is is similar technology, and it's probably why they sell uh, all of these products in concert. So what you can do is you can install some Windows software on your computer that is a VPN or it creates almost a fake VPN on your computer and then processes at the network card level all of the internet traffic flowing into the computer. And then it'll actually modify or remove or strip the advertising code before it even gets to the browser. So there's nothing that even Chrome can do about it. And so if I'm buying advertising on any advertising platform and those ad units are put into um the the website in a way that their ad blocker can detect it's going to strip those out before it ever gets to the the browser so there's like literally nothing that we can do about it now if the ad blocker is a good one it will do it before those ad units actually load and so theoretically, I shouldn't be billed for the impression as an affiliate if it's like a display ad, a banner ad, or some some type of advertisement um, that way. So if the ad blockers are doing a good job, affiliates generally should not be affected at all. But if the ad blockers are doing a shitty job and they're masking the ads inside of the browser, for instance, and they're not actually stripping the code out of the browser, or worse than that, if they let the advertisements load, but they just don't show them to the user, then it's almost... Then someone's getting fucked. <laughs> Yeah, it's almost like ad fraud at that point because the ad network's making the money and the affiliates paying for it and the ad blocker is just hiding it from the user. So I think 
you know, obviously Ian's company probably does this at the network level. They make real software and um, I'm familiar with a bunch of their products. And so I'm not suggesting that Ian's company is, is being shitty at all. In fact, they're probably doing it the, the right way. But a lot of these ad block products likely aren't um, because it's much more complex to go down to the network layer of a computer and, and write that type of software that's intercepting traffic versus um, just sort of doing it at, at the browser level. So um, anyhow, uh, let your yeah, ops team know about. that I apologize on the minus one subscriber that they got today on ad. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, too. Well, if Ian, you, if you didn't use an affiliate link, then it doesn't really bother me. So okay, Ian, as long as you're unaffected. <laughs> Ian, speaking of subscribers, I'm actually curious, like who's your target demographic in terms of the actual end users who are purchasing these products? Sure. So I think this is something that's evolved a little bit recently. Um, you know, we would, as you know, the media buying team would tend to focus at the start on a slightly older demographic, certainly in the antivirus space, um, primarily because, you know, they're the ones that have photos of their kids on their computers and the, the stuff they keep on there they, they maybe are not afraid with saving things in the cloud that was going to be my guess is the older demographic but then i was thinking do they even know that these products exist so so yeah the older demographic but after that where do you think it next goes to yeah so i think with antivirus it's still very much that kind of area um we are seeing more and more as you know there's there's news all the time about um new viruses and especially data getting stolen that's a big one so we are starting to see that demographic age come down if you look at things like vpn vpn tends to lend itself to a more smarter crowd because you know at the end of the day you probably only want to buy a vpn if you know why you need a vpn um, so the element of knowing and understanding what a vpn can do how it can protect you how you can mask what you're doing or, or whatever it is you need to do there um that demographic then becomes younger um with password manager this is something that's growing massively um day by day and i think because of mobile usage and the storage of passwords and the sheer amount of passwords that you need now password manager is becoming a much younger demographic in comparison to the other two here's a here's a question that just pops into my head does the Products under total security, do you guys ever deal with fraud issues like people hitting up your clients being like, hey, I'm so and so from total password here to help you recover all your passwords and their motive is really to get all of their passwords like what's the, the flip side of that look like. So we've tended to find that from a full perspective, because we always had a relatively hard stance on the traffic that we allow we don't necessarily get that so much. The biggest issue that we have is the compliance area. So if you say, for instance, might see a pop page or something like that with a fake scanner on it and someone will use our logo or McAfee's logo or Norton's logo and say, you know, you have a virus, that kind of method of traffic is more the issues that we see and try and stay on top of a lot more than, you know, someone pretending to be from us and giving phone calls to people. So you did just, oh, I go ahead, Adam. Yeah, I have a question for you. Um, I'm really interested because I've never run antivirus campaigns as an affiliate. It, it wasn't my thing. J just to give you some background, Ian, um, I was really big in lead generation, a lot of education leads, dating leads, all that, that type of thing back in the day. And so as an affiliate, I'm very curious, like, what are some of the channels that do really well? How are affiliates, without giving too much information, uh, you know, or throwing them under the bus, like how are they running these campaigns? Are there traffic arbitrage opportunities? Like how do people actually make money being an affiliate of these different types of products? Sure. So there's, there's a couple of main sources of traffic. The, probably the biggest one is PPC, uh, review sites, um an seo where content's being written about these products and you know, the pages are listing from it push is a massive massive side of our business um many many years ago when push started it was rife with aggressive very you know you have a, a you have an expired license you have a virus on this computer click here and what we've been able to do over the last three years is basically 
approach the sources of the traffic and say, hey, don't sell the traffic to these guys that are running this stuff because it's harming your subscriber base. You know, people are unsubscribing from push because they're being hit with all this aggressiveness. If you had an offer that was clean, paid great, multi-language, multi-device, we can give you the tools. All you have to do is plug it in. And a lot of these networks, especially the push networks, now run this as an in-house offer where previously they may have not even had in-house offers. And now they run it not just on unsold inventory. Um, they also run it on um, you know, actual traffic they would normally sell on a click basis. Pop traffic, you know, we we run pop pages that are clean as well. Um, and we do a lot of display. Um, ironically, what we're seeing more and more now is on the ad block side. Um, so what we're seeing is these guys that are on 50 or 100 websites and get a lot of traffic to it, they will run ad block display ads fixed instead of GDN. So what they're doing is, is they're running a direct offer on the display, uh, monetizing the clicks coming in. And obviously, because it's a fixed ad, it's up to them if they remove the ad on their domains because it's not a bit of code. It's almost like an image. Um, and it does really, really well with these guys. Um, I think the the two other things to look at is obviously the device. So are you targeting desktop? Are you targeting mobile? Um, that can really differ the kind of traffic you want to be buying. Um, and the other one is geo. Um, we do a lot of traffic in the EU. Um, like I said, 10 languages across all our products. So it really is, It try, we try to fit around the traffic more than the traffic tries to fit around us most of the time. So for all of our listeners, Ian just told you how to get your ads on banner and display around an ad blocker. You go directly to a website, you negotiate a direct deal, and you get them to place an image on the website with your link that doesn't include any JavaScript code that his ad blocker is blocking. And then you can get all the impressions of all the people who have the ad blockers installed <laughs> yeah well i mean the downside is is that from being in a from the affiliate side of the point of view um when these guys started to do this um we were quite suspect we didn't think that there would be enough traffic to warrant them to go down this route um but we're seeing more and more this kind of old school publisher against new school publisher so you think of all your I don't know, your uh, like big magazine publishers that maybe focused on print stuff previously and have now taken everything online. Um, you know, they still value a lot of the real real estate around the content that they're writing. Whereas these new school guys, they know that the affiliate link is important, but they also know that they can't sell the ad space to us because we could just go on GDN, bid far lower than the CPM they're charging us, and we could get the ads anyway. So what do you do? Well, you find three or four good quality direct offers, create fixed ads, stick them there. And, you know, if the ads work on all devices, all geos, then you've got a recipe for money if that's what you want to do. Ian, right before Adam uh, asked that question, you did mention a couple of your competitors. And I'm curious, what were some of the approaches that you guys took when you launched or that you continue to take moving forward that kind of really separates you guys from the competition like why why should i use total security and your products over somebody else who's doing something similar sure uh so one of the biggest things from our side um harrison may know this from working with us on and off previously is we're a relatively young company in terms of the demographic and the age of the people that work here so that means that we're far more flexible um we still run like a startup so if we want to get something done we get it done very quickly we spot an opportunity, we can spin these things up nice and quickly because, you know, we're marketers at heart and we want to make things work the right way. If we compare ourselves to a lot of our competitors, everything or pretty much everything we do is a direct relationship. So we can offer far greater support, flexibility on payouts, on pay structure, and also the I, I was going to mention you guys are so strong on the payout side and I know nothing about what you're paying today, but we've done business over a decade ago and um, you guys really look at the lifetime value of a customer when made, doing payouts and like, for example, I've ran traffic to antivirus offers and, you know, they've given me like a small rev share on the sale price. 
you know, these guys were like, here's this revenue. We're essentially giving you two years of the revenue or something like crazy yeah. on it because they're, they're looking for long, long term recurring revenue from customers. Yeah, I think the, um, the, the team here have, you know, a great way of understanding how much the lifetime value of a user is three to five to seven years down the line. And obviously, the longer we go, the more information we're getting, which gives us far more flexibility on a, a front end CPA payout. And again, because there's no middleman, you know, you're working primarily directly with us. Um, you know, we can we can pay more than going through a network. And many of our competitors run possibly some relationships direct, but they might run some relationships in, say, certain areas of the country or certain areas of the world through a network, which means to run one brand worldwide, you might need five different contracts, five different logins, five different people to speak to. And we try and alleviate that and make life easier. Ian, as a uh, direct question, well, hold on a second. I want to touch on the networks. Do you guys still work with network relationships? Like, what's the ecosystem for your product category when it comes to uh, affiliate networks and, and third party traffic today? Sure. So, up until about two years ago, we were very strict about working with networks. And the reason why is, is we dabbled in it at the start and we found that we completely lost any kind of compliance level. Um, so for about a year, we were getting requests to, to put the product in what you might call a classic affiliate network. And the way that we did this is we actually started with one or two networks that we knew had internal traffic to begin with. And we said, well, if you can prove to us that by us giving you the link internally and you can run traffic to it, buy traffic to it, it's fine. Then once you kind of earn the right, we can then give you the opportunity to, uh, you know, give this network, uh, sorry, give the links out within your network kind of environment. Um, we did obviously also make it very clear that um, if there were problems, that, and you know, if there were compliance checks that needed that by them networking it, we would lose that one-to-one -one conversation with the person. So it was on them. Um, and it's worked really well. Um, this has probably where been where our biggest growth has been in the last year, is that we held off for a year, tried to find the right partnerships that were affiliate networks that could have it internally to begin with. These three guys proved themselves. We gave them the right to network it. And that's just, you know, really shot up the affiliate stuff we've been doing in the last six months or so. With with, with obviously the element of compliance in place. Um, so the quality of the traffic's been very, very good as well. You mentioned one of the benefits of going direct, uh, cutting out the middleman, you know, typically making more money. I'm curious, in your opinion, like, what are some of the the other benefits of going direct outside of just making a higher payout and more revenue. Sure. I think the flexibility um, is probably the biggest thing because you're working with the brand directly. We can tell you what we think works. We can tell you and show you what we would do if we were buying the traffic. Obviously I'm not a media buyer, um, but I do know our compliance rules. So I know the lines to stick within. I know, you know, how can you maybe try and toe the line without crossing the line those kind of conversations you can't have through a network. And a lot of the time, the network may even misunderstand what we set as the rules. So they may in inadvertently cross the line. Um, and that can cause obviously troubles with the network, with us and, and all of that kind of thing. Um, the other main benefit, as you say, is the flexibility of payout structure. So, you know, through a network, you might be fixed to a net 30 or a net 45 payout. You know, with us, if you do certain volumes, we can go monthly, bi-weekly, weekly, depending on, you know, the quality that you send. A lot of the rights we give are rights earned as opposed to rights given. So if you can prove yourself to be good, then, you know, we can give you the world to, to make it work, basically. And as a direct advertiser yourself, what do you look for when affiliates um are trying to sign up to work with you specifically like what are some of the questions they should be asking or should not be asking because i think this would actually provide a lot of value to people watching this episode right now especially if they're working in this vertical so what do you typically look for when a new sign up comes in openness so i will be as open as anyone in terms of 
you know, trying to give the guys or, you know, the people that sign up the keys to, to make this work. Um, we want to ensure that they know exactly what they can do, what they can't do, um, and also be upfront with where the traffic's coming from. Um, in my eyes, it's an unwritten rule that we as an advertiser shouldn't be, you know, sharing other people's ads. We shouldn't be telling them what works and what doesn't work in terms of the lines. All we do is is give the the guidance of what you can stay between and then give that uh, affiliate the freedom to to do that. If you look at the things that we don't like, laziness is probably one of them where, you know, if you come to me and say, hey, I want to run this page and it's a straight rip of some internal stuff that we're doing, then, you know, come on, try and play with your imagination a little bit. That's um, probably that's probably why you stopped working with Harrison, right? Laziness. Yeah, I mean the the command C command V button was you know, probably worn out <laughs> yeah, sure. a long time. Um, I think when you look at red flags, the biggest red flag for me is if you start asking about money before you've even asked about like what you want to do and how you want to do it, it. It just jumps to me that you want to quit in and a quick out. You don't want to grow anything long term. Um, I, I love that. It's kind of like the affiliates that don't look at the EPC. You know, this guy's paying me this price. You, why are you paying me 20% less than the than that guy? And then you run the other guy who pays you 20% more is offering your EPC is 40% less than the guy paying you 20% lower. You're like, huh, I wonder if I might be getting scrubbed to the high heavens. Well, the biggest one for me is always the conversion rate question when they go, can you tell me what the conversion rate of the product is? And they've not outlined the traffic source they're buying where they're <laughs> buying it how they're buying it anything and yeah, like, like how long's a piece of string um so definitely more questions about how to make it work rather than what am i going to get if i make it work that's that's definitely more what we look for so ian i thought this was a really cool question that you actually came up with um and i'm really curious about your answer here if you were to start from scratch and do a completely different niche that's one of our favorite words on this podcast by the way what direction would you go in and why so i think what i've learned from essentially managing all the affiliate traffic since we started was that i didn't set my stall out early enough so you tend to find when you're launching a new affiliate program or certainly i found that you want to give every tom dick and harry a link and just get started and you know chug out as much traffic as possible whereas actually creating this kind of feel that getting a link from the, the affiliate program directly is a privilege you know it's uh, it's not a right you don't just get one uh creates this kind of feel around the program that you're lucky to have it and that you don't want to waste it um so I think if I was to start again I'd definitely be more strict over who I initially start to give the links out to um i definitely spend as much time um looking over competitors within the new space how are they doing it are they direct are they through a network um what kind of back-end tools are they getting um how easy are they to contact as an affiliate what kind of turnaround time um one of the things i sort of pride myself on is that you know my Skype is always there and most people will get an answer within an hour very quickly if they message me most hours of the day. Unfortunately, because of the main time difference with myself in America, uh, with it being quarter past eight in the evening now, for example, um, you know, it might be the morning, but you'll get your answer pretty quickly. And I think just in case that, our listeners didn't know, Ian is British. I am British. <laughs> just uh, I'm not sure. sure. I, I've, I'm not Never from now. British accent either so you know um and um I think one of the the biggest things um that I would probably do if I tried uh you know started again would essentially just be you know the research element I didn't do enough to start with and look and speak to the other publishers you know speak to the guys that are going to send the traffic and ask them directly what is it that your competitors in the space, if you're running a review site or running the same traffic, you know, in that niche, um, what don't they give you and what can we give you and be more flexible about to make your life easier? 
Earlier in the uh, podcast, you mentioned the glory days of installer traffic. And I know, I think you hinted at Harrison kind of took part in those glory days with you. So can you revisit that? I don't that know what and- you're talking about. <laughs> so what what were the glory days of installer traffic? What did that look like? Yeah, so before we built Total Security, we've done you know many other products, primarily in the uh, software space. And one of the ones that we had done was a product called PC Backup. It was an online backup tool, backing stuff up into the cloud, think your, your Dropboxes, those kind of products. Um, and it took us a couple of years once we built this to realize that we could actually uh, distribute the product via installers as sort of secondary offers. And there was a period of time for 18 months to 24 months where, you know, we were probably not doing as much due diligence in terms of where we were giving the links and who we were giving them to. Um, and those glory days in terms of the reach we were getting, um, I actually have a story that I don't know if Harrison was there at this, but there was a, a conference we went to once in Israel. I was at this this event and I yeah. remember everyone there was just banging stuff but it was a compliance conference and like the microsoft and google people were up there and they were talking about all these great rules here you put the compliance check box here and this and it's like a panel with like three antivirus people some google guys some microsoft guy and then like aggressive 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 install people and i remember we talked we were like bro how are these people on the same stage with those people and they're shaking hands suits shake you know like the whole thing that was politics it that yeah i remember that in very well <laughs> yeah, yeah and i think the the level of distribution that we got i mean it's weird because we've come like completely full circle and now the complete opposite you know we're an antivirus now you are the antivirus guys we yeah. are the antivirus so we're like the the we're the, the stronger element in all of this. But back in the distribution times when when our other products previously were being distributed, at that same conference in Israel, I remember going out uh, for a few drinks with some some guys and we ended up in some club in Israel, some kind of dark, dingy, only served like one type of can of beer and shots of vodka and that was it. And uh, there was a DJ um, that was playing music and he was streaming his large screen from a screen behind the bar on off a laptop screen. And we were stood at the bar buying drinks. And in the corner of the laptop screen was a my PC backup pop up uh, that came up because he'd installed the product and it showed on the massive big screen on the uh, it, on the dance floor. Uh, and I remember it very well. I, I, I have the picture somewhere. I've never been able to find it recently, but um, you know, deepest dark, because Israel even found my PC backup. So yeah, got, you guys got, helped got, back up that guy's mix. That's pretty big. Exactly, exactly. His and, set and, was on your servers. <laughs> yeah, you guys were an official month. We would we would do that. Really. You're an official sponsor of the party at the club. <laughs> exactly. Accidentally, by the way. Well, I know you went to a lot of shows uh, back in the day. And before we let you go here, I just had one more question about the trade show life. Um, you know, you've been around for a while, so I'm curious. Do you still find that you get the same value from attending trade shows, especially, you know, with a focus on your vertical, or do you feel like it's not as necessary as it used to be, you know, kind of given like where we are in today's day and age with technology and how easy it is to, you know, get virtually face to face with somebody. What's your opinion there? No, I think we, well, I personally definitely get, uh, the same amount of value, but it's different value. So seven or eight years ago when we started and, you know, I was still having previously gone to shows, um, having those contacts in some of those places, being able to say, hey, you know, we're starting again. These are our new products. You know, you've got a starting point from from where you've been previously. What I tend to find now um, is we spend or I spend most of my time at the shows probably 80%, 85% existing traffic and 15% hopefully trying to hoover up some new stuff. Plus all affiliates are worldwide, you know, and being in the UK, I don't have a UK based affiliate at all from all the traffic that we do. They're, you know, primarily in the States, in Europe, Israel, those kind of places. And it's my, you know, the five times a year I get the chance to sit down with them, have a beer, you know, 
shoot the shit kind of thing. It's relationship growth and development. It is. It is. And I'm sure Harrison will agree from, you know, the times that we've been at the same shows and, and you guys as well. Some of my best affiliate relationships, you know, they haven't come from, you know, either coming through our platform. They haven't come from meeting people at the show. They've been sat next to someone at dinner that invited me where someone else invited me to that dinner. You know, I didn't know this guy existed. We started chatting and bang, you've now got a brand new relationship that you would have never bumped into at the show um, or, or found any other way. That's one of the coolest aspects of business in general. Honestly, I could think of, of a lot of uh, relationships that have grown from literally being sat next to someone at a dinner. I mean, Adam and I have like, you know, one of our, our great industry friends, we met 18 months ago at a dinner. We were sat next to each other. We ended up chilling that night, just talking on the couch in our suite till three in the morning. Adam knows who I'm talking about for sure. Yeah. We, we, and not we, only that, yeah. I mean, I literally met Harrison at an industry dinner. So don't go to Buca de Peppo, though. If you're holding an event <laughs> dinner, do not do it at fucking Buca de Peppo. Dude. It's, a, it's an insult to this well, industry. Harrison, I don't know. If you look at Buca de Peppo. ROI of on that lasagna Peppo, and those meatballs. <laughs> oh. Yeah, on that basement dinner. I mean, the numbers are kind of crazy, bro. I don't know if we should really hate on the book. Buca de Beppo just catching strays you know what? We right should do now, a, dude. We should record a podcast one day from a Buca de Peppo. Just because you said yeah. that, Adam. You and <laughs> I will get the setup. We'll have a lasagna that we will throw on the floor. We'll be great. No. <laughs> Adam's out. Not. I tried, out. guys. This was for you, the listener. Ian, I want to thank you for uh, working late into the night and hanging out with us on the Affiliate Marketing Show. For Josh from OfferVault.com, Mr. Paper Call, Adam Young, the industry legend, Harrison Gewurz, and Ian Leefield, the head of business development and affiliate management at Total Security. Let's make that paper. Let's make that dough. This was the Affiliate Marketing Show. We will see you next time, everybody. Marketing Show.